Welcome to The Extra Dimension. This episode is on the topic of long-distance travel featuring Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ian R. Buck. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED16. So by long distance travel, of course, this is AKA the boats, planes, and trains episode. Boats, Indeed. planes, and trains. Yes. There she blows. You know what the three most exciting sounds in the world are? Uh-huh. Breakfast is served, lunch is served, no, dinner. No, 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 no. Anchor chains, plane motors, and train whistles. Peanut. So this is going to be quite a bit different than the other episodes in our travel mini-series on the Extra Dimension because all of the other ones, all the other forms of transportation that we've been dealing with are like within one metro area. So there are things that people could use for their daily commute, um, for, you know, visiting nearby friends, you know, for, for day trips, right? This one is way out there. Yeah, the the ways that these types of transportation work uh, varies from location to cl- location across the world, different regulations and rules and how they're governed and what types of um, fuel and whatnot they can use. So it's mm-hmm. it's a little more wishy-washy in terms of how strict all these things we're talking about. Yeah. And like different different economies are going to dictate, you know, d- different things about these yeah. as well. Because there's, yeah, there's a lot that goes into the price of a ticket for each of these things. And um, oh, there's a lot of factors determining how quickly each of them will work and, and how efficient they are, etc. Whereas the, the stuff within one metro area is, I think, a little bit more straightforward. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's give uh, kind of a, a brief overview of the three forms of transportation we're going to talk about here. So first, planes are, I would classify them as kind of like the the car of long distance travel. A mechanical travel. bird. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, with planes, they 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 share a lot of the same characteristics as like owning your own car does, right? It's it's point to point um, for the most part, unless you're like going to uh, outside of a main metro area, right? Yeah. Well, I think cars aren't quite point to point because you can kind of stop wherever. Or a plane, you have to you have to land. At oh yeah, yeah. Airport. So it's it's a little more. I'd say in terms of infrastructure planes are probably more similar to boats or trains because they they all have ports airports or a, or a naval port or like a station that right have to stop at otherwise there's like you you can get off a boat in the middle of the ocean you can jump <laughs> out of a plane and you can hop off a train not at a station or a port but it's it's a lot less convenient right but yeah so so what i was trying to do there was like comparing the long distance ones to the short distance ones and seeing, you know, so like, I think the plane has the most in common with the car. Yeah. It can, it can drive, it can kind of go wherever it's independent. Mm -hmm. And it's, I would say it's pretty similar to a boat too, except boat is waterlocked, whereas a car is landlocked. So the boat and the car are kind of the opposite. And the Mm -hmm. plane is the thing that's like, ha I can fly over you. Um, So yeah, planes are also like the quickest out of the three. Yep. um, And they use the most, like they're the least fuel efficient per passenger out of the out of the three yes yeah no small part because they have to kind of fight against gravity (laughs) yes there's that little thing that keeps us all on the ground (laughs) yes indeed now boats yes as you said the they're great in specific areas right because they are waterlocked uh so if you live in the middle of a continent boats are probably not going to be a great long distance option yeah whereas trains Trains will only work, you know, cross continent, right? You can't. So you can put a train on a boat. Oh boy, <laughs> sounds like a very large boat now. Well, yeah, you just have some tracks and yep. cars. I don't know. I've never been on one, but I know they exist. So a train ferry. Yes, that's crazy. I know there's one from um, an island on Denmark to northern Germany that you can take. Hmm. I bet you. They, I bet they just break up the train. They do like two or three cars next mm-hmm. to each other on a whole line. I don't. I don't know. I just know it exists. That's all. That blows my mind, man. Yeah, that's fascinating. I would see when when you first described that, I thought um, I'll try and find of... a photo here and put it in the show yeah. notes. So. 
With planes, there's a lot of things that go into the cost of a flight, because um, they are, as, as well as being the quickest out of the three, planes are definitely the most expensive, because you're obviously paying for that convenience of getting to where you're going more quickly. So there's a lot of things that go into the cost of a flight, starting off with, of course, the fuel, um, but that's actually a fairly minor component, especially if you are on a plane that has, like, all of its seats filled. Um, which is what airlines try to do uh, whenever possible. Overbook it. Yeah. That's kind of the technique used for that. Uh, so crews, of course, they have to pay all the people who work there. Airport fees uh, are going to be, you know, if you're at a very large airport, that's going to be a large fee. And that's that's a pretty big reason why airlines like Spirit, Southwest, Ryanair, and mm -hmm. EasyJet, and things like that are so cheap because they use the airports that are an hour outside of the city because their airport fees are a lot lower because they're not huge. The next article is actually about how budget airlines reduce costs. Oh, well, there so, we go. Yeah, yeah. We also have a few taxes. So things like the FAA and TSA, uh, you know, they, they have to make money somehow. And of course, mm -hmm. tickets the pay US. for that. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, it'll be different when you are in different countries. The cost of buying an airplane, of course. And fun fact, the life of an airplane is not by like how long it's been in travel, how long it's been in the it's air. It's by number of pressurizations, right? Yep, yep. It's by the number of trips because the that puts a lot of stress on the parts of the plane, gets, you know, micro fractures and whatnot. Yep. Uh, and they have to repair those and and eventually they can't repair them well enough anymore. Yeah. So going along with that, of course, maintenance, right? That costs money. And then there's administrative costs of the airline as a company, right? Because they don't just pay the people who work on the airplane. They've got all the support people and the CEOs and the, you know, all, all, all those other people. Those there. web developers for the wonderful websites. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, there's insurance because we have to have insurance for everything yep. in, in our day and age. Um, so uh, on the whole, actually very little of like an economy class ticket is going to go to the airline as profit which is you know makes sense because there's a lot of competition out there right so they they have to lower their margins in order to be competitive yeah yeah uh so, so go ahead i guess one one other thing that might be uh worth adding it though it looks like we might get into it a little bit later down here too is uh a lot a lot of uh, other sources of profit right past the ticket price for an airline comes from th items like uh, ancillary fees. I know this is one in particular that I believe Ryanair has kind of been commented on rather comprehensively because it's uh, certainly with like budget airlines too, it's often the case that doing anything past just like boarding the plane generates kind of a bunch of different ancillary fees. Like for example, a friend of mine uh, was flying out east and bought his ticket well in advance, but when he went to check in, the airline actually said they couldn't issue him a ticket in that sense because he was oversold, but he could upgrade to a different seat that would um, would allow him to issue a ticket before before he uh, boarded, which is like, what? That's so off the rails, right? Because you paid for your ticket. But th that's another way that airlines can, can make money in addition to kind of reducing the cost of these other kind of rather fixed kind of things that they need to pay for. Mm -hmm. And I know Ryanair makes you check in I think before two hours before your flight, and you have to do it on your home computer or your phone, they'll charge you, I don't know, it was 40 or 50 euros if you don't do it and you have mm. to do it at the airport. And they'll also, they sell like scratch games and some lottery tickets on the airlines. I know probably food and beverages is a way of making money on, air, mm -hmm. on airlines. And especially the budget carriers won't give out free food or anything. Right. Yep. Yeah, so let's let's dig into a few more things that budget airlines uh, do to reduce cost. In addition to the stuff that is consumer facing, there's a few kind of behind the scenes things as well. Um, they order their planes in bulk, and a lot of times they'll they'll kind of keep an eye on the market for that. So like when when there's very little demand for planes, you know, they'll buy up a whole bunch of them even if they're not going to use them right away. And they buy all of the same type of plane, mm -hmm. so. They can only have to stock parts for one particular model for repairing and maintenance over the lifetime of their fleet. And then also the training for the crews who are going to be manning yeah, those yeah. planes. Uh, you know, you, you train them once and then they can work on any one of the planes that you have on yeah. your airline. They obviously go with less luxury features on the planes themselves. And uh, 
they hire a lot of staff who are kind of at the beginning of their careers, especially like flight attendants, and they have their flight attendants do a lot of different jobs that at, at other airlines, you know, more specialized crews would be doing. So yeah. all the, the cleaning and whatnot. And they buy new planes still because they're more fuel efficient, so they can um, reap the, the benefits of mm-hmm. new fleets and mm-hmm. modern planes. Yeah, and then they, they sell stuff to you on the plane uh, that sometimes would come free on other on other airlines. Uh, but that's okay, because that's why I always bring like granola bars with me whenever I'm traveling. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and they also, they don't usually operate out of like large airports. Uh, they'll, they'll use kind of like nearby, fairly nearby, uh, smaller airports. And typically, they'll be like the only major player who runs out of that airport. So they, they have a lot of power at the negotiating table because if if they don't get favorable rates at the airport then they'll just leave and 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 the airport has no nothing there and they kind of shrink away exactly yeah one of the kind of interesting uh aspects of this too is that even massive like super massive carriers like delta and united have to deal with this in a lot of cases there was a big deal a couple of months ago where delta was kind of angling to keep it, it's uh, slots at the uh, Tokyo airport, mm. um, but that they, they just like uh, lost out to, I believe it was United and like Delta had been operating a direct route from Minneapolis to Tokyo for like forever. Like that was their, that was their like claim to fame back in the 20th century. So it, that's kind of the sort of negotiation or kind of the, the, the difficulty or the risk that causes a lot of these budget carriers to try to pick other airlines mm-hmm. or not other airlines, other airports that are perhaps a little bit uh, further flung, but uh, you don't have to fight with folks who are already too busy fighting with each other. Right. Yeah. Speaking of fighting with other people, another way that they encourage their passengers to actually show up early uh, and, you know, so that they can get off the ground quickly is uh, they don't have assigned seating. Typically, so, you know, you, you show up first, you get to be the one to choose the best seat in the house. And uh, they also use the point-to-point model quite often. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the hub-and-spoke model versus the point-to-point model uh, in a couple minutes. Uh, but that basically, that means that there's, there aren't going to be any, like, connecting flights for most, for most routes. Though the times that their flights might go are quite inconvenient. Yes, yes. And they do have their planes like running all the time. So as soon as a plane lands, gets its people off, the, all the passengers off, you know, they, they clean it up, they do any required maintenance on it, and then immediately like it's scheduled for another yeah, flight. Because more air, more planes in the air at one time means more money. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then <laughs> here's a really funny one. They don't, you, they don't typically use jetways, which are like those, those ramps that bring you from the building to the plane uh you know they'll have you take like a bus out onto the tarmac or uh, or just walk out to the plane right yeah has that ever happened to you guys at, at minneapolis though i thought that was like a thing like minneapolis doesn't have a situation where you. i don't think i ever have in minneapolis that. no but yeah in, in I, Europe, I think there's some airports that have like regulations against this like if you have a landing slot you're using a gosh darn jetway hmm. <laughs> i yeah i've only encountered that on a very small flight from Helsinki to Stockholm, and it was you know it was a small airplane, so it, it made perfect I think, sense. I gotcha. think I used I don't think I hardly used any jetways at all when I was in Europe, and I I probably flew hmm. ten or twelve flights there, and it was it was all uh, bus or walking to the edge of the airport and then walking on the tarmac going up the stairs. Mm-hmm. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, I never I never uh, realized that. Like the only time I'd ever used one of those uh, like steps. Uh, so the steps was when I was uh, flying to Canada and route to Europe and uh, in Toronto it because that plane was so tiny uh, as the CRJ 100 essentially like they like the the, the stairs basically came with the plane right you, you didn't oh, wow. need to do a ton to <laughs> yeah right uh, that's a small to, plane yeah exactly exactly so wait that you were taking a small plane across the ocean to Europe no 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 uh, from Minneapolis to Toronto oh okay gotcha uh, yeah, 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 and uh, because that's just uh, the Toronto airport there is such a massive hub for Air Canada, they basically like let us out in what looked like a, a, a warming house at an ice rink, and we just like <laughs> took a tunnel from said warming house, right, which is just like where they had all their CRJ 100s land, and uh, and then you like walked uh, half a mile, and then you were in the in, in the main terminal where you could get on a big plane. <laughs> yeah, I think the what airport am I thinking of? Was it the Stansted Airport outside of London was similar, or maybe it was Amsterdam? Ah, yeah. I don't remember. But it was kind of a similar situation where I was 
way far out and had to walk probably half to one mile just to get oh from, wow like the main area in the airport all the way to where my flight was so mm-hmm. you have to kind of budget that yep definitely definitely heathrow is like that too for sure so there is a particular thing that I came across that you can do while looking for tickets to reduce the cost of your tickets, and it's called uh, Hidden City Tickets. Have, have either of you heard of those before? No. A little bit, yeah, but continue. So I think I, I accidentally did this sort of when I was traveling to Sweden. More on that story in a little bit. But so what, what Hidden City Tickets are is they, they take advantage of some of the weird economics of airline pricing. So let's say a hypothetical situation uh, that Delta has uh, a line from Atlanta to Cincinnati for $251, okay? Um, because they're the only ones who fly directly from Atlanta to Cincinnati, uh, so they don't have as much competition, so they can jack up the price, right? Now, let's say that Delta has another route that goes Atlanta to Cincinnati to Dallas, and uh, because other airlines also fly from Atlanta to Dallas, uh, so that's, that's you know looking at the whole trip, not just each individual part, Um, because there's more competition on that route as a whole, they have to lower their prices to $200, right? So what you could do as a customer, if you knew that that was the case, you could buy the cheaper ticket for the whole route from Atlanta to Cincinnati to Dallas, and then you would just get off at Cincinnati and not get onto the plane going to Dallas. Uh, And you've saved like $50 off of your ticket price. that's that's clever. Yeah. And the airline's probably a little unhappy because they they have a seat. Yeah. But then they can, you know, for overbooking, then they can. Right. Yeah. Still, but yeah. And, and so there, like, this became kind of an issue when, uh, somebody created a website that would, like, actively search for those yeah, kinds of yeah. situations and alert people and, you know, so, so that they could buy those tickets. And it, it's kind of a niche thing and it has to be a niche thing because if this became a mainstream way for people to buy tickets, then like the whole economics of the situation would change uh, and airlines would have to start like doing something drastic to compensate yeah. for that. Because it, it's, it sometimes it's just strange to think about, you know, a direct flight is more expensive than a two, two flights that connect. Then, you mm-hmm. know, at, at some point, you know, the airlines are making a much larger profit on, on particular routes than others. And so it's, yeah, I wonder how they would counter that if it becomes more of a, yeah. Widely right. known concept, and I like that you brought up that um, the airline would have to use overbooking to compensate because uh, they like having an empty seat on an airplane is just about the worst thing that could happen for them in terms of the you know efficiency and money making areas, right? Yeah. Now the the reason that that I sort of accidentally did this one time was I when I was traveling to Sweden. There was some complicated stuff going on with my visa, my student visa, and while like I had bought my ticket a long, long time ago, couldn't change it or anything, right? But I couldn't legally enter the country until my visa was uh, accepted. Okay. And so I, my, we came up with the solution of, okay, I'm getting into Europe at Dusseldorf in Germany. I'll just get off there and not get onto the plane that goes to stockholm missed your flight yeah exactly and so because of that like yeah we had to do some complicated things like not having any check bags because the check bags would you know transfer over to the other plane automatically Uh, so i was carrying everything around for that i was going to have for four months uh in a single duffel bag that's crazy it was pretty crazy and uh and yeah we like contacted a family in germany who we knew and we were like can ian stay there for like an indefinite period of time until the swedish government says that i can come into the country turns out it was less than a day Okay, well, so oh, I probably nice. I could have just gone to Sweden and nobody would have cared. Yeah, but yeah, but it was a fun fun experience. I bet. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. But yeah, so that's those are hidden city tickets. Kind of a moral gray area. Yeah. T- <laughs> uh, I I do not encourage or discourage people <laughs> from taking advantage of that. Ian takes a neutral neutral stance on that. <laughs> all right. So earlier we mentioned the point-to-point model, um, which is common for budget airlines to use, and it contrasts with the hub-and-spoke model uh, of airlines. So basically what this means is uh, the hub-and-spoke model is kind of the traditional way that, that airlines have worked. So let's say that you've got 
uh, you know, a bunch of people who want to get from like the east coast of the United States to Europe, right? It would cost a lot to have airplanes that can go all the way across the Atlantic Ocean at every single airport along the east coast, right? So what they do is they have smaller airplanes carry people to a hub airport, and then everybody who wants to go across the ocean gets on one big airplane that can make the trip, uh, and then they all go, you know, so so then they go, so they, they go from spoke to hub, and then from hub to hub, and then, you know, from wherever they are in Europe, uh, then they would go from that hub to whatever spoke is their final destination, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it allows airlines to run far fewer routes, and it also, like, changes which which airplanes are going to be at what airlines or at which airports right yeah um so you have the really large like large capacity long range uh airplanes at the hub ones but it's inconvenient for the passengers right because they have to take more connecting flights you know that it, it takes more time for it all exactly yeah and there's and there's just like more that could go wrong right when you're transferring Missing from flights one. And, yeah 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 exactly so contrast this with the point to point model which has direct flights from those secondary, those spoke airports to other airports that, you know, that the person wants to go to. And of course, there's going to be a lot less demand for most of those routes. uh, So that means that they have to have smaller planes. And until recently, those smaller planes couldn't make those long flights. But we're seeing recently more planes coming out that are smaller capacity, but long distance still because they're very fuel efficient. And because they're very fuel efficient, they can actually be like a lot cheaper than the hub and spoke model. So we're kind of we're kind of at a, a shifting point in in what is the norm um, from hub to spoke to point to point. Yeah, I, I saw a video comparing the uh, Airbus Dreamliner 320, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Brandon might be able to correct me on this. He's a uh, so, Yeah, so the, the Airbus A320, so Dreamliner is a is a Boeing. Oh, uh, it's Boeing? So wow, that's record, awkward. Okay, Airbus okay. A320. And then the, yeah, yeah. the the Boeing uh, 787 Dreamliner is that it the super efficient one? Ah, uh, so this the so the 787 is the super massive one, right? Oh, that's um, oh, I think I it's like it. the 737 or something. No worries, I'll. I think I think I know the ones you're referring to. So the okay. A320 Neo is like the uh, your standard plane that you might take from say like Minneapolis to New York or Minneapolis to California, right? So it's going to be a three by three. And and those are like they've they've been uh, in production since uh, I think the early the early two thousands. Yeah. Uh, and um, they're often like in use, particularly in um, Delta and and United and like Air Canada fleets, right? So yeah. they're that's kind of the the majority of uh, is that, type of one that use those. And that's more of a point to point plane, right? It it can or... be used as both. Uh, okay. Hilariously, I actually took. For, for example, when I w- went to San Francisco, I actually took a, an Air Canada, or I took a, a, a CRJ uh, 100, one of those tiny planes from yeah. Minneapolis to Denver, Colorado, and okay. then boarded an A320 to go from Colorado to San Francisco. Uh, huh. So I actually took that tinier plane for a longer trip than that uh, larger plane for that short trip from Denver yeah. to San Francisco. So the, the the point there being that the seats are more important, the number of seats is more important than uh the the range of the plane perhaps in that case mm. but you're absolutely right that um the a320 kind of size class right so that's usually uh best suited for like cross continent trips right so uh you could uh, conceivably take an a320 from new york to san francisco uh certainly from minneapolis or chicago to san francisco or minneapolis and chicago to new york and usually that you can an airline certainly a delta or or united or american airlines sort of like class of carrier could uh, fill up that size of a plane passengers going either which direction but mo- perhaps most interestingly is uh, there's, there's a tiny well not so tiny it's hard to call an aerospace company tiny but uh, there's a there's a company out of Brazil called just a second while I pull this one up it's Embraer E-M-B-R-A-E-R uh, not only does it kind of look like it has the phrase bay in it but um, <laughs> It makes really, really <laughs> tiny planes that are super efficient. Uh, and in fact, United just United and I believe Air Canada just purchased a handful of these planes here that I'm going to put in the show notes. Uh, it has a ton to do with this 
increase uh, in long and skinny routes here. Uh, it's called the ERJ-175 or the E-175. Uh, and this is about the same size as you might imagine a CRJ-100 would be, probably a little bit larger, but it is it has that kind of higher range uh, that kind of shifts in the the passenger share right of these of these sorts of routes is, is kind of a difficulty because the 787 is very much uh, going to go from point to point because it's one of the highest capacity planes you've got right it, it it's it's not uh, really the sort of plane you want to be moving around a ton it's it's going to be making r really or rather I guess it's going to be making really really uh, high capacity trips between hubs and it's going to be doing so perhaps at a uh, a less frequent basis, right? So uh, this is the sort of plane you'd fly from like New York to Australia, right? Mm. Very, very long range and very, very high capacity. Yeah, and uh, a lot of the research that I did, I found a ton of useful stuff on a particular YouTube channel called Wendover Productions. Um, yeah. And link links to the pertinent videos in in the show notes i highly encourage anybody who finds this an interesting topic to go and watch some of those videos uh and probably if you've been listening to us for half an hour by now uh you do think that this is an interesting topic yeah for sure for sure Pl planes and trains and boats but perhaps for for me personally to a lesser extent boats there it's all fascinating stuff So, who here is really enthusiastic about train travel? I like trains. I trains are amazing. I do too, and I feel like I haven't had any opportunities to really try them out. Yeah, have, you ever, I, have you ever gone on Amtrak, Ian? When I was very, very small, so I barely remember it. I have used Amtrak for, I don't know, I've probably been on an Amtrak train five or six times. So I've gone to Chicago twice on Amtrak. Sorry, maybe eight times. So I've gone to Chicago twice, that's four. Four trips on it. I've gone to a small town in Wisconsin to visit my cousin once. I was like ten or eleven. How'd you get to a small town on a train? Was it? Far? It stops. It stops. Oh, it but it's but it was a long. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like it's okay. a small station. It, st it stopped for like four or five minutes. Okay. So yeah. it yeah. is a little bit, but it does kind of hit some of these smaller towns. Mm -hmm. There are stations, so you can you know drive. But from but there it, it it wasn't like out of the way of the twin cities to like Chicago. It, line. it was it was along the same route. Because, okay. Yeah. That makes you sense. know they they follow they would take. Amtrak in the U.S. at least has they share all the tracks with cargo and freight. Right. So BSNF and uh, oh gosh, the other ones. Uh, CN Kennedy Northern here in Minneapolis or yeah. in Minnesota particularly. Yeah, I'm amazed that you know that off the top of your head. <laughs> so I, I like Amtrak a lot. <laughs> I think the only tracks Amtrak really owns is between the New York and Boston. I think yeah. they own that, so they can. That's a very high traffic route, and so they can own they own the tracks. So they can have routes whenever they want. Otherwise, they kind of have to work around commercial use on mm -hmm. these tracks anyway so and then i've also taken it f from iowa into new mexico when i went to philmont scout oh nice camp when i was in ninth grade your so whole ago. your whole troop went that way yeah well all 10 or 12 of us plus huh. a couple of the okay. adults so yeah we, dr we drove for i don't know six seven hours to iowa there's a station picked up a different m track line and then took that into new mexico and yeah that was that was really fun cool so th those are the times my most recent time using m track was this last uh March when I went to Chicago. Okay. Yeah, so according to the video that I found, there's kind of this sweet spot of cities that are like 200 to 300 miles apart where getting onto a train in downtown in like one of those cities uh, and then getting off of the train at downtown in another city is actually going to be faster than like going from downtown of one city to an airport that's probably, you know, not, not right in the middle yeah. of everything, right? Uh, getting on a plane going to the other city's airport and then going into the center of the yeah. city from there. I would say one of the most alarming things about taking a train, at least in the U.S., the Amtrak, is how easy it is. So you just kind of go to the station, you go to the counter, you say, I'm here, so you do your kind of check-in, and then mm -hmm. you just go wait, and then when the train arrives, or close, when the train is about to arrive, you just hand them the ticket, and you just walk. So similar to like a boarding gate in an airport, mm -hmm. but you can do that you know, all within 10 minutes, and there's no security check. I'm thinking of Union Station in downtown St. Paul. You just kind of walk up, you hand them your ticket, and you walk on the train, and then it leaves. So That's it's amazing. like it's like 
you can do that in 10, 15 minutes. You know, maybe you want to get there a little early in case it's early or late. Sure, sure. Probably won't be early knowing Amtrak, but <laughs> it is really convenient. And then you just, and then you you leave so quickly and then you're just, you're moving. You know, you're on this, on the mean of, or you're on the train longer than you would be on a plane, but you're, mm. it, you're moving constantly. You're not waiting in an airport. I think delays are different in terms of trains and planes. So, yeah, absolutely. This is a very interesting kind of kind of comparison here. A couple of months ago, I was going to Chicago for an event and um, I had I really badly wanted to take Amtrak to get out there, but unfortunately just because of the the kind of uh, range of times that I had to depart, I couldn't get off work that Friday morning, so I had to leave at some point Friday afternoon and I wanted to come back as late as I could on Sunday makes kind of train travel dif- different or rather rather difficult in that situation but you you n- hit the nail right on the head there Brian it's kind of intriguing how regardless i still spent the same 8 hours moving from airport to airport to to uh to plane or i guess first to get to the airport then uh checking in going through security waiting for the plane to arrive arrive boarding the plane uh actually flying to chicago took all 30 minutes uh and then it took another hour to get uh, from the airport into town, and same deal going the other way around. So, like the even though like the the total time right spent in tr- in transit, shall we say, on both sides was relatively similar. That's that's kind of one of the one of the really kind of tragedies of Amtrak in America, in particular, is like there's only one train going to Chicago from uh, St. Paul on any given day, as I understand it. Yeah, there, there are there are multiple cars shall we say on the train right so it's it's there there are actually two units to every empire builder train not that not that it really matters but like it um, splits once, into uh washington and oregon i believe right? yeah yeah exactly so it might look like there there are two trains every day but they leave at the same time because once they get to st paul they're all the same train they hook up and they're and they're back don't they hook up in montana or they yeah it's way beyond st paul but yeah 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 yep yeah. yeah, exactly but in another in other countries, right, train travel is so much more frequent, so much more frequent that it's it would have been totally ludicrous uh, for for me to try and fly to a place that's a whole six hours away by by train or by yeah. car. And I think I know at least when I was in Denmark, a lot of people were there's there's a, a kind of a cultural con, um, conscious about like using the the budget airlines because they pay their workers a lot less they cut quarters mm. and so there's kind of almost i feel like a pride of taking a non-budget airline and that brings up cost a bit more and so i think and then you know um, it's like the walmart issue use, yeah right and then fuel use and things is you know they're gonna say okay maybe taking a train is better because of it's longer but it's it's better for the environment and you know it's kind of it's kind of a, it's a fun part to have on your trip because oh, totally. since you leave so quickly, there's no airport stress. You're on the train quickly, and then you're just hanging it's a bit, out. On it's the... more comfortable than a plane. Oh, yeah. The Amtrak seats are wonderful. There's an outlet next to every single seat. <laughs> the, the seats are giant and super comfy and so much legroom. And then you can walk along. There's a great like a window seat or, or window train car, the, the mm-hmm. lounge. Many, oh. many games of cribbage were played by between my mother and I while we were traveling around Sweden on trains. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's so fun. I really wish I would have taken more trains in europe i wanted to take a train from edinburgh to london but mm. it was quite a bit more expensive than ryanair it was like 20 dollar flight or a, oh boy or you know three or four times as much to take a train but mm. there was an inconvenience with getting to the airport and things it's the stansted airport is quite a ways out of london you need to take more of a longer well actually i took a train there it was about half an hour and then i got to the end of the tube network and then it got in the metro there and ran, ran on that for like another half hour. So it was an hour commute outside of the city. And I think trains, especially in Europe, have the um, central stations like in the city. Yep. Because they're, oh, yeah. they're old stations and the city kind of grows around it. So you are dumped off right in the middle of everything. And so it's Absolutely. really convenient to take a train there. So let's talk a little bit. Let's dig into the reasons that... Tr- the train situation is so different between Europe and the United States, and most of it, most of what I'm going to talk about is is the history of how trains developed in the United States. So, like, obviously in Europe, the the population centers were kind of there already by the time trains the train system was developed, right? Um, yeah. Whereas in the United States, like for most of the continent, 
the the train line coming through was the reason that things were placed where they were right yeah. Pure, um, you know every every 20 30 miles or something there'd be a town that would come up that would have grain elevators so farmers could kind of mm-hmm. hub and spoke their their grain production and then you know people said well i need to need to work these elevators might as well build a house here and then you have little towns popping up mm-hmm. and so if you if you map train routes and towns it's just it covers a lot a lot a lot of them yeah and so because of that like those train lines were created specifically for economic purposes right yeah. for moving stuff from from one place to another and in, in a lot of cases yeah grain farm produce and because freight hauling was where the money was the passenger cars existed primarily as a way to advertise the railways to the business executives who would be deciding which company to contract with so they the rails were geared towards high class fancy stuff for those executives right Mm -hmm. and once cars and planes kind of came around and and those became kind of the the high class desirable modes of transportation there was very little incentive for the railway companies to like continue putting effort into their passenger car stuff right um, um, simultaneously too if i might just jump in here yeah, like go for it. a lot of a lot of like uh air travel really rapidly it, as as far as the scale that it took for train service passenger rail to be built throughout the united states air travel was a much quicker road if i if i recall correctly to oh, Man, air travel is, is a much quicker road. Yikes. Mixed metaphors. To, to kind of adoption there. So as as soon as, right, like uh, air travel became a thing that was really kind of glamorous and desirable for executives, it was just a matter of decades before before that became really accessible to the masses, right? And then we, we kind of look upon the 50s and 60s where, you know, a, a lot of consolidation ended up happening as we head into the 70s among the the major worldwide carriers, right? Kind of the decline of Pan Am and TWA, for example. And what what that really happened, like that coincided with the decline of passenger rail in America, particularly as we like look at uh, how Nixon kind of formed Amtrak into this into this like government agency to end passenger rail, essentially. There's a really interesting piece about this that I, I had thought I put in the show notes uh, previously, but I haven't. I'm going to look that up right now about how really, as, as you mentioned, not, not only just bringing away these desirable passengers, but just bringing away all passengers, essentially, from uh, passenger rail. Right, because until... Kind of made it undesirable. Until Amtrak became a thing, there was like the railways were required to have a couple of passenger cars on every single one of the trains that they run, right? Was yep, it? that's exactly right. That's but it's exactly so bizarre because right. these routes are not you know, geared toward commercial uses. So right. Probably just empty cars a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, now, for whatever reason in Europe, I'm actually not sure why this is, uh, but there's not much freight that is, gets transported via rail. It, it grew uh, more into this this passenger thing. And so because of that... Like we said earlier, Amtrak doesn't own most of the tracks that it operates on, right? It only owns a few tracks in the on the East Coast. And um, so because of that, like, the companies that operate those railways don't have much incentive to give Amtrak priority on their railways, yeah. right? Because that, that's not making them much money. Um, they make money by moving produce around. And so, so yeah, there's a, many more delays on Amtrak lines than on european lines um because they and a lot of times like i think on european lines um the rail lines are all owned by like one kind of government entity right uh and and that also operates the trains themselves so they're not competing with anybody else for the use of their lines in the uk i think it's been a little bit more privatized but the national rail uh kind of entity yeah it definitely is still the dominant kind of dominant power in that space that doesn't really cause the same problems that, say, Amtrak renting from BNSF or CN kind of does. But uh, that might that might have changed recently. I don't know, Brian, because it sounded like you took some national rail when you were headed into London. Is that is that right? Barely. It was uh, Abellio Greater Anglia was the name of the the company or route. Oh, no way. So that that's that's kind of an interesting little 
commentary on privatization there too, because that that same company off, operates, if I'm not mistaken, the kind of national rail in France as well, or at least throughout kind of the the the, the region of of France, uh, the administrative region of, of which Paris is a part. Because I took uh, a similarly named uh, route, but clearly not for Anglia. <laughs> that was that would take me from Paris to Versailles. So that that's kind of an, an interesting thing too, because I think I think you're right that while the the government agency definitely can kind of maintain those tracks, I think the operation of the trains and, and perhaps some of the ownership of the trains is even kind of centralized in Europe, which is fascinating given what uh, what might be going on with Brexit in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I also did use the Copenhagen to to Malmo route between Denmark and Sweden a little bit. However, that was they have the this. Öresund um, train network there, so it's kind of the towns along Sweden and the Cop Greater Copenhagen area. It, they share these these trains, so the like the voltages and the thing that the trains, the, the tracks, they're all kind of compatible, so you can mm -hmm. have trains pass through there. Right. So it's it was a little bit more of like a, a big metropolitan area, quite a massive one, and felt less like a long distance train. I had ridden a longer distance train from Co the Copenhagen Central Station to um, an another town, uh, Roskilde, a bit outside of Copenhagen. But it was just kind of like one stop along the way up to northern Denmark. So it just happened to be a, s a smaller station for its route was the my destination. So it was like oh, yeah. it just moved a little faster and skipped a lot of the smaller stations along the way. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten a little glimpse into the longer distance, but I, I would like to use a lot more rail. I think the EU is pushing for something. So everyone, when they turn 18, the EU will, will give every 18 year old a ticket for one month of unlimited rail travel that would encourage travel and sightseeing within the EU train network. Oh, that I don't sounds know if, if that is, if that is passed, but I, I was reading something about it just a week or two ago. So just like the, the summer after you graduate from high school kind of thing, like, yeah, I think go out and like see that, some yeah. stuff. Yeah, totally. Can Minnesota join the EU? <laughs> I do know that Amtrak has something similar. So you can buy a one-month pass for Amtrak and ride any Amtrak line around. So that is a thing in the U.S. as well, but you do have to pay for it. And I, yeah. do, I have a friend who did that a couple of years ago. I'd be interested in doing something like that. I think that'd be pretty Definitely. fun. It'd be Definitely. expensive, and you'd have to know people in cities for stopping in. But mm. yeah, I think a big, a big comparison between the U.S. and Europe is the size. So the U.S. things... You know, the U.S. is maybe kind of comparable to the size of Europe, but Europe is a lot more dense in terms right. of the large cities and how close they are. Where the U.S., you have the East Coast is pretty dense and a lot older, so there's probably better rail networks over there. Mm -hmm. Then you have these big commercial lines going west, and then you have your West Coast, which has a lot. There's probably some better rail there, though maybe not quite as much as the East Coast. And, you know, you have this, like, Rocky Mountains in the middle that just kind of, like, Nothing that just trains huge, have to go through. Empty space. Yeah, so so I think that's kind of why planes took over so quickly because the difference in you know to go from east to west coast in the U.S. is several days on a train, where you can fly it in a few hours. That's a lot better. Where Europe might have some faster trains, more dedicated lines that are mm -hmm. more express route from across across Europe. Yeah, and you'd you'd think that given that it's spread out so much that we would be able to make some like high speed railways that go across the country kind of thing and i'm not sure why they don't exist uh around 2009 there was a big push i know for uh certainly some high speed rail from between between minneapolis and st paul and chicago i think i think it might have even extended as far as fargo at one point and w one of the difficulties of that well well for one at the risk of getting a little political is that wisconsin uh, the Wisconsin governor at that time was uh, rejecting all kind of uh, federally federally appropriated funds for his state. Well, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and as a, as a result, kind of the the progress on that has uh, had, had halted. Uh, so there hasn't been a whole ton of movement since then. And additionally, there was some kind of weird bureaucratic stuff going on with the city of Rochester, I believe, uh, because the hmm. that high speed rail line that was that was slated to go from Minneapolis to Chicago. Yeah, uh, wasn't wasn't originally going to go through Rochester, but Rochester is a, a pretty significant city in its own right. Uh, has pretty. It could really you know, help Rochester, I think. Exactly, and they probably wanted that, right? 
Yeah, and it's like it's so intrinsically tied to like uh, the Mayo Clinic and a bunch of the other like IBM's out there in Rochester. Yeah. So there's there's like a bunch of of stuff that's really like that 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 kind of caused Rochester to leverage as much pull as it could to to get on uh, on the line, which really only paradoxically served to delay the project more. I I don't recall no. uh, where we're at on that front, but uh, I'll do some digging right now and pull that into the show notes. Now, a project like that is just tremendously expensive and i think it's it's kind of hard to you know you hear about europe having all this nice rail and compared to the u.s not very good but you know europe did pay for all of this back you know a lot of its older routes that are have been maintained to be modernized but probably not as much as the initial building because mm-hmm. you have to flatten land out and work a lot of stuff and yeah. i think the u.s needs to it it takes a lot of money to invest in this but it's a long-term investment that's going to help transportation for generations really now bringing up rochester reminded me that this summer when i was working down at camp in cannon falls which is right in between the cities and rochester i saw a lot of signs along the way uh saying like that 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 were against some something and i wasn't sure what this acronym was for so i looked it up and it was a proposal for a high-speed rail line going from the cities to rochester and of course the people in between don't really see any of the benefits all they're going to see is this rail line go through their area and kind of mess with the traffic patterns there and uh, and so a lot of people along the way were against it which i found rather interesting i think you know if they only had two stops so rochester and the twin cities maybe you know for high speed maybe that was the case but i think it if, you know, if I was in a small town along a route like there, I think I would be okay with it. I think, though I'm a public transit nut, and so, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm more okay with that. But I think... It, You're a public transit nut, which is why you live in an area that actually would be surfaced by public transit. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, I'm open to it. I like, I like seeing progress for transportation options. I'm also okay with federal money going to th- projects like this where more rural people may not be. Right. And so it's, it becomes a political thing. You know, who who sees the benefits? Oh, it doesn't help me at all. I don't want it. Mm-hmm. I don't. Why, why should my money go to this? And that, you know, makes sense. But I think, you know, long term, you need to have hundreds of projects like this around the U.S. to have many, many, many routes. And then people are going to start to see, OK, so I could ju- then drive 20, 30 minutes to the nearest town with the train station. And then I can go anywhere very quickly mm-hmm. without having to fly. And I think Absolutely. That's, and, you know, you have more train stations and airports and then you can kind of hop on a train and keep going and to transfer trains probably is easier than in an airport. However, hopefully not as probably not as quick. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I I don't think the U S will really ever get to a network like that. I think there'll be some key routes, at least not in my lifetime, but I don't know. There seems to be a a push though in the twin cities with the extensions of the light rail lines Mm -hmm. and things. So who knows? And I know um, there's, they're working right now on the, LA to San Francisco high speed line that that's getting put in. So oh, okay. there is there is some work, but it's gonna be, you know, huge, huge routes that people take a lot. Yeah. First. Well that's where you gotta start, of course. Yeah. All right, I think it's about time to move on to boats. Indeed. What are you talking about? Oh, good. I, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. What are you talking about? I'm talking about ships. Oh, okay. I ship, I ship this. <laughs> Indeed. So I have had relatively little experience with ships. I took a single cruise from Helsinki to St. Petersburg and back, uh, which was, you know, a single overnight f- deal. So how about how about you guys? I've done something kind of similar from Copenhagen to Oslo. It was uh, about 18 hours, so overnight, mm-hmm. and it it was by far the nicest boat I've ever been on. They I've always heard of it called a ferry, but it was really like a small cruise ship. There's you know a, a good restaurant. There's a little duty free store inside. There's a like a, a two floor dance bar club place. There's decks all over. So it there's a little like a. A swimming pool spa area though the the water was pretty you know not super warm and um this is a hot tub by the way and right. pretty pretty small amount of water so it 
it was kind of a more than a standard ferry that you might see going, you know, an hour on the water across some river or, or sound or something like that. That'd be but, a big river. Yeah. <laughs> an hour. <laughs> yeah, maybe not an hour. So I, I do also um, know of, or I rode a ferry from, in, in Denmark again, from this one town to an island called Eu, 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 it's the A-E combo letter R and then an U, which is the O with a slash. Okay. It's, it's difficult to pronounce sometimes. And that, that's an island that can only be accessed by boat. So there's a ferry. You can actually see on on a satellite image, you can see where they've dredged out. So you can kind of see a route in the water. Oh, which my gosh. Kind of so this is a maybe an hour and 20 minute, I think, ride. And so, you know, they have cars on it. They have trucks that go in there that has food and things for the island. So it's a very important route. And I think they're, you know... A hand, you know, a dozen every day or something. So there's this lot wow, throughout yeah. the day. So we went on there with our coach bus and classroom full of students and went there. Now, I was also saying earlier, there are train ferries as well for some train routes. It can be a lot. So in the Copenhagen to, to Hamburg, there, that's along a train route. So Hamburg, Germany and Copenhagen, Denmark. If you were to take the train all the way there via land, you would be going from from Shelland on Denmark, their main island where Copenhagen is, to, to Fuhn, which is the middle one. And then you go into the land of, of Uland, Jutland. And then you'd be going into Germany and then looping around. And that's so much farther than just taking a ferry for a couple hours with a train on it. So mm-hmm. they do the ferry because it's a lot faster. Right. And so that's, you know, an area where boats can help with speed. And it can help access small populations where you don't have direct land access. Right. But you still want to do something there. How about you, Brandon? Yeah, uh, believe it or not, the most experience I've ever had with like boats as passenger transportation has been in like San Francisco with a water taxi to Sausalito. They have some water taxis in New York as well that I've done, and then just really, really like minor ferries in uh, in the UK. But it's uh, you know certainly growing up in Minnesota, there are almost no uh, situations I can think of where uh, a boat will do you much good past. Yeah getting from one end of the lake to the other, right? Because we're definitely kind of landlocked uh, in the continent, certainly within the Or like, you know, well. for fun, like a like canoeing for, for fun in an afternoon. There or... are some ferries mm-hmm. that go out to small mm-hmm. islands on Lake Superior. Yeah. And I've oh, taken I've, those. Yeah, I've taken one to Isle Royale, actually. That oh, yeah. was three hours, maybe? Mm-hmm. Through super fog. It was really quite a ride. <laughs> um, oh, goodness. And oh, so that's I, true. I have, I, so I have taken that one as well. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that now. <laughs> um, I should also note, in Copenhagen, there are water buses, so nice. this is you know part of their metro their their transit program. You just get on, you just like a bus, you know, you kind of tap your metro card and ding, and then you're on, and then it just goes mm-hmm. in a route there. So there, that's also an option, and I know many cities do have that. I think I would that's imagine amazing. Venice probably would. They have so much water. Now the area that boats really kind of excel at is that they've kind of become this thing where the the trip is the destination, right? So I'm thinking about giant cruise ships, yeah. um, and and so they're they're these very unique experiences that you can't get either on land or on any other type of transportation, right? You're not going to go on a plane for the sake of being on the plane. Trains are a little. <laughs> you might not. <laughs> and, and there's there's just there's no other way to move like a six story building around <laughs> in one piece other than this is true in the form of a boat. Yes, we have not invented sand crawlers yet. So Not yet. that's yeah. So yeah, the cruise ships are a really really interesting kind of situation because they're so unique. There's nothing else quite like them. And they this is an area where you see kind of the biggest class difference in in a transportation method, right? Uh mm-hmm. we do see a little bit of it in planes and in and in trains a little bit but far far more uh on on like cruise ships first of all you got to get on the cruise ship right and oh, that takes hours and hours and yeah. and, and and i mean and also it's it's it, you know it's expensive to go and take a, a cruise right yeah because you got to you know it's it's the that's the entire vacation right there uh is being on the cruise ship and we've seen in recent years some cruise lines that are like putting in a lot of effort to differentiate the experiences on their lines between the regular passengers and the like highest end um, tickets, right? Hmm. Uh, and in some cases, the, the article that I was reading was talking about this uh, Norwegian 
company that has uh, on some of their ships what they call the Haven, which is like this uh, kind of ship within a ship, uh, an area that's totally exclusive. And if you're not in there, you don't know that it exists, basically, uh, because that's that's how like separate from everything else it is. Um, so it's a secret society and Reddit. Kind, yeah, kind of. And then, <laughs> and then, but then other lines uh, kind of wear it on their sleeve a little bit more where they, they have the really expensive exclusive stuff, but it's visible to all the other passengers. And it's, it's, it's kind of a different approach because that does serve as advertising for those exclusive features, right? But uh, at the same time, it could lead to uh, some, you know, people getting resentful uh, that they're not getting the full treatment. Um, for most of the other forms of transportation, usually the price differentiation is based on like how much inconvenience you're willing to put up with Mm -hmm. as opposed to like how much really, really nice stuff you get. And yeah. And so, so this is kind of like the, the biggest example of like visible class differentiation that we've seen since, you know, the Gilded Age of the 1800s, early 1900s, uh, with, you know, like, for example, the Titanic, very famous, had, like, entirely different sections for the different classes of tickets. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and you couldn't get from one area of the boat to the other. Except if you were, uh, what's his name in the Titanic, the movie? Leon- oh, Leonardo. Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah. his character. Mm-hmm. Um, what's from his name, Jack? I don't even, I've been so long probably, since the movie. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's kind of an interesting trend. I don't know how I feel about that. Because, I mean, I, on one hand, it's like, yeah, you, if you pay more money sure you get more stuff and i don't mind that and i'm like i i totally am aware it's just the the economics of of you know who's gonna if there are people who will pay for more they'll then they'll provide more mm-hmm. yeah um, and i think a lot the, yeah a lot of the debate is like how how visible do you make it to everybody else kind of yeah. thing right how much how much is it you're paying to like to exude wealth among the <laughs> right. so are you are you paying for luxury and and uh, secret luxury or are you just paying for luxury right yeah publicized? exactly yeah and I can totally understand like not wanting to be around most of the other passengers because like if you're if you're a really famous person uh, you don't want to be walking around like the ship and just have people like holy crap it's Brad Pitt or something like that and so yeah like that that would be a feature in and of itself that you don't have to have other people see you. Uh, but you can still have a good time. So I don't know how much we want to go into this, but there's a lot of maritime law around ships. Yeah. Basically, there are some zones outside of your a country's borders. So the first 12 miles is considered territorial. That's stuff where a country can regulate and things like the ship, yep. including weapons. Literally, their spy. laws apply. Yeah. You are Things happen. If something happens on a boat within 12 miles of the shore, you are like legally that country. Mm-hmm. And there are tons of cases where you might have a boat from another country because you know if you're in international waters it becomes who owns which country is the boat registered to or made yep. from so there's all t- types of ways to to do that and there's some interesting cases with like children being born like which country mm-hmm. are they part of and mm-hmm. and it, it's it kind of extends that way for space travel as well yeah which, yeah which we'll get to in a couple decades when it's more relevant and we'll we'll talk about that i think a little bit more in the next episode yep. as well but basically you know when you're when you're outside of maybe 12 or 24 miles of a country, you can, the boat has a lot more freedom so they can, I know the, the cruise ship or the cruise ferry ship that I was on from Copenhagen to Oslo after it left the, the Urusund, which is the area between Copenhagen and Sweden when they're pretty close together. When it mm-hmm. left there and was outside of this territorial zone, it switched to a much dirtier fuel. That's a lot cheaper. Mm. And so there's things like that where, you know, if it's no man's land, you know, who can kind of regulate things like this. Right. Right. And, th- but I think still, Taking that ship, I was. This is for a sustainability course, so the um, environmental impact of that ship was still far less than taking a plane. Right. Yeah. And there are some interesting cases where, like, yeah, you have countries that are closer together than those two hundred miles or whatever it is that your like kind of influence extends out into the ocean. Yeah. And most times, like, I would imagine that between sweden and and denmark they just kind of take the midpoint between their two coasts and okay that's where the line is but in some other situations like uh, the south china sea where there are tons and tons of little islands that are owned by yeah yeah. and and like it's very valuable sea and there are are countries who are claiming multiple countries claiming an island because it's the middle of this area yep yeah yep so that's fun that's fun and yeah, if you want to know more about maritime law, uh, go and, and click on the uh, video that we have linked to in the show notes. Uh, it's a really, really comprehensive look at this whole situation. 
Yeah. There's also a really interesting portion of the TV show Arrested Development from the early 2000s that deals with maritime law. Highly recommend that as well. <laughs> interesting. For a comedic side of education. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yes, indeed. If you're if you're ever looking to set up a fake construction company and uh, and escape conviction through maritime law, a good example of how not to do that is uh, in the TV show Arrested Development. Mm. That is all I'll say about that. So I added this little note at the end here for environmental comparisons. Um, I think it's just important to to compare these a little bit. So planes are by far the most pollutive. Um, I'll I'll use this example of going from Copenhagen to Oslo um, for the sustainability class. We took a boat because it would have been I think almost 900 pounds of or 900 kilograms of CO2 per person to fly, and it was closer to 20 to take a ship. So to, wow. a, ship, a ship, you know, has a larger engine that's going to pollute a lot, but there's so many more people that can fit on this ship. Mm-hmm. And, it's like you said, it's a six story building that's moving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so, you know, you're, you don't have to fight to stay in the air. It floats. If the engine's off, it just sits. It doesn't crash and burn, you know, right. it's, you just have to push. If everything's forward. going right. Yeah. You just have to nudge <laughs> it forward a little bit and keep it, keep going. We're playing. You have to, you have to go to higher speed so you can fly. And it's, it's, it's a lot more, takes a lot more energy to do that. Mm-hmm. And trains can be completely um um at least while while moving um zero emissions if they're you know the electric overhead and that is powered by renewable renewable and sustainable energy sources when i was in norway i saw a lot of their train infrastructure is electric overhead Mm. um as well as within the the copenhagen area all their like longer distance greater copenhagen area trains you know that are up to an hour an hour and a half to get from the bottom to the top those are all electric overhead. So similar to the light rail transit here in the Twin Cities. Right. Um, I'm not sure what a lot of the longer distance trains are. I think a lot of them are diesel. Mm-hmm. But the, yeah, the, the one I took from the Stansted Airport to, to London was also a light rail electric overhead. The one that I took from Stockholm to Luleå, which is, you know, overnight the entire length of the country, basically, yeah. of Sweden. Uh, that was definitely not an electric one. Yeah, I think I think Copenhagen to Malmo was also mm-hmm. diesel. I think that was also the one of the routes that they use like some of their oldest trains on because mm-hmm. like it's just it's so like who who's gonna go all the way up to Luleå? Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind yeah. of thing. So there there's room for very clean use with trains, but it it is a lot more expensive to do, especially longer distances. It's a lot more infrastructure to run. Mm-hmm. If it breaks, you your train can't go. So you, mm-hmm. it has to be hundred percent all the time. Where I think there's been some some looks at you know a train track. If there's like a two inch gap between a track, the train can just like go over it fine. So oh. th- there are some like graceful things where electrical you need you need to have that, mm-hmm. or else it it just falls apart and won't move. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then there there are like, I mean, boats are the ones with the most history, right? You know, because we've been using the ocean for yeah. transporting oh, and if, stuff. If you sail on a boat, you're you're pretty good there too. Oh yeah, not using it, mm-hmm. and boats can be diesel or a dirtier fuel or nuclear um, or mm-hmm. sail or or human powered or even, growing or... yeah or, or even like uh there's that that guy with that crazy contraption little little vessel uh where he traveled across the atlantic ocean under his own power that was yeah that was quite cool was that like he generated motor or power for motor and did no that, or he'd like road or paddle or... Uh, i think they, they had this weird like he was like walking, and that was what was powering the oh, thing. I, yeah, I'll I'll have so to treadmill kind of wheel type sort of thing. something. Yeah, okay. huh. interesting. Well, I think that about does it for long distance travel. Yeah, yeah. If you are interested in more transportation-related stuff, uh, check out the other episodes in this mini-series. Uh, previously, we had cycling, we had cars, we had uh, public transportation within one metro area, and uh, and then the next episode is going to be the future of transportation, and that will be our final episode. We'll, we'll probably talk about Hyperloop, space mm-hmm. transportation... Self-driven maybe, cars. Maybe even touch on teleportation. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> Stargates. Yes. Right. <laughs> Warp drives. Yeah. So, number one. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on uh, Twitter as Ian R. Buck or links to other things that I make at ianrbuck.com. 
I am Brian Mitchell. You can find me on Twitter at underscore Brian Mitchell underscore or at my website, brianm.me, which has links to all my other social media sites. And I'm Brandon Johnson. You can find me on Twitter at Brandon underscore MN. You can also find me pretty much everywhere else, including Instagram, Snapchat, and probably other places that I'm not remembering right now also at that name. My website's brandon.mn. You can also hear me at other fine shows on this network, including uh, Apple-related Nexus specials and PodKit, which I do with my co-host. My co-hosts, who I think both are currently in this room, but one is currently on the show. Hi, Uh, that's me. That's Brian. (laughs) (laughs) And if you would like to give us any feedback on this episode, any follow-up, you can hit the contact link on on the webpage. Once again, the show notes exist at thenexus.tv slash TED16. Or you could hit us up on Twitter at the Nexus TV. Um, also, since this is our variety show, if you have any ideas for other topics that we can tackle, uh, let us know. Or if you want to be on an episode to talk about a topic, let us know. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. <laughs>